This is my first time in Slovenia. I think I should first kind of introduce myself. I hold a Bachelor's of Science in Physics from the State University of New York. I hold a Master's in Biomedical Engineering from Drexel University in Philadelphia. And I hold a PhD in Environmental Sciences from the New University of Lisbon. So just to give you some academic background, because I will be covering from noise to cells to health. So, and this is what gives me the right to do so. Um, we will first talk about the agent of disease, which is infrasound and low frequency noise. These are pressure waves that come through the air. They are not constant. They vary in time, in frequency. They vary in time, in amplitude. And a pressure is a force per area. The World Health Organization, I have to get this straight. The World Health Organization calls noise inanimate mechanical forces. So basically noise or any pressure wave that comes through the air is an inanimate mechanical force, which you may or may not hear. So it's not as simple as uh, one would like when we are talking about specifically low frequency noise. What is the difference between low frequency noise and the noise that we hear? Basically, it is the distance between the waves, between the peaks. Low frequency noise has a very large distance, while high frequency noise, which is what we hear, it's a very small distance. For example, at 3000 Hertz, we hear very well. The distance between the peaks at 3000 Hertz is around in the centimeter area. When we go down to the low frequency, 20 Hertz is considered the limit of our hearing. In the low frequency, the distance is 17 meters. Rule of thumb is, when you want to make a barrier, an acoustic barrier, the thickness of the barrier must be on the order of the wavelength. So if you want to protect against 20 Hertz, you need a barrier of 17 meters. Okay, maybe you have special materials, 10 meters, that's still very big. And when you go down to one Hertz, it's 343 meters. This is the problem with low frequency noise. It penetrates into the buildings. It penetrates the earth. And this is why it is a problem for human health. We all know about radiation. Usually the public is very aware of the radiation. We all know that in radiation there is a very small section where we can see. But then we have ultraviolets and we have x-rays and we have gamma rays and these we do not see, but they can affect our health. This is the same in acoustics. In acoustics we have audible sounds and then we have infrasound. We also have ultrasound. I study, I and my team, we study the low frequency, so that which is audible but barely, and also the infrasound. Please notice, I don't know if we have health uh, scientists here, please notice how difficult it is to study infrasound because we put everything in one bag. Here we have ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays, we section it. It allows us to study it better. But with acoustics, we have audible and infrasound. Big bag, no segmentation, which allows us to study the different frequencies on the different tissues. This is one of the main problems of studying the health effects of infrasound and low frequency noise. Historically, we all know, since uh, the time of the ancient Greeks, we all know that loud noise can make us deaf, can impair our hearing. So, historically, we have tried to concentrate protection of, against noise in the area where we hear the best. So, conversation area, which comes about to 500 hertz to about 10,000 hertz, this is where 
we concentrate all of the protection of noise uh, uh, hearing or ex uh, too much noise exposure. As you can see, the hearing is always what is protected. The body is not. It is assumed it wrongly by many that if you don't hear it, it won't hurt you. Okay? Well, we don't see x-rays either, and it hurts us. So the idea, it's unique in medicine, unique. The idea that we have to perceive the agent of disease for it to harm us, it's wrong. We don't see viruses. We don't see many things that are harmful to us. Why do we insist in noise that we must hear it for it to be harmful? This is not a good methodology and we shall see there is evidence for this. So, why the DBA? This is one of the biggest problems of understanding health. DBA was conceived to protect the hearing. So, let's see. Here, it is almost a straight line. And let's look. The frequencies is 1,000 and about to 10,000. This is where we hear very well. So now let's look on that side. See here, it's zero. This means when you measure with the DBA at these frequencies, the difference between what you measure and what is really in the environment is zero. Great. We want to protect the hearing. It's a great thing. The DBA to protect the hearing is great. But when we go down to 10 hertz, the difference between what we measure and what is there is 70. It's a huge error. The DBA is completely inadequate to be quantifying anything really below 100. Anything below 100, the DBA gives a huge error. Huh? If you had a scale for weighing yourself, and what? After 60 kilos, it starts making a bigger and bigger difference between what you are and what is there. You would throw away the scale. And yet, we still use uh, this, and of course, the uh, 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 justification is, well, if you don't hear it, it won't harm you. So it doesn't matter what we measure down here, we don't hear down here. But it will harm you, as we will see. This is an example. It's a, a movie of an uh, environment near a wind farm. What you see here is the DBA measure. Notice it will never go over 40 DBAs in this example. But this is, is what is really there. This is what you hear, but this is what you are exposed to. And it is not being taken into account in hardly any legislation uh, in the world, although Russia has infrasound legislation specifically for the cities. So we, it's, there is somebody who knows something. Our team has been recently measuring, we have a new equipment, and we are now measuring noise with this dB linear. Notice at one hertz, the difference between what we measure and what is there is zero. At 10 hertz, the difference between what we measure and what is there is zero, etc., etc. This is the way we can scientifically quantify the agent of disease. We are not even quantifying it. We are not even acknowledging it is there. So for science, it's very important to get a number to find out how much is there. And you can do this with infrasound and low frequency noise as long as you have a dB linear. Any measurement who says they are measuring infrasound and low frequency noise and they give it to you in dBA units is scientifically invalid, okay? So, I will now give you some examples. These are old examples. I will show you also new examples. This is, uh, we did, we published this in the uh, year 2001. 
So we measured the cockpit of an airplane. This is a commercial airplane. We measured in the train that was stopped at the station and in a car. Notice the DBA levels are very similar. So common scientists out there will tell you, oh yes, these are acoustically equivalent environments. In theory, if I put a rat in the cockpit, a rat in the stopped train, and a rat in the car, they will all develop the same problems, in theory, because the DBA level is the same. Well, let's look better into that. The black bars represent the cockpit. The blue bars represent the stopped train. DBAs are similar, but look at what is really there. There is more in the stopped train than in the cockpit. So you would hear the same in the cockpit or the train, you would hear the same, but you will be exposed to more in the train than in the cockpit. This is the car, same situation. This is my car. This is my Fiat Punto when it was young, okay? So notice, I am exposed to more acoustic energy on the body in my car than in the cockpit. And of course, the car with the windows closed and the radio off and the subwoofer is off too. My car comes with a subwoofer from factory, huh? low frequency noise. Huh? So, as you can see, we would hear the same, but we are exposed to completely different amounts of acoustic energy. In terms of biology, our cells respond differently to different frequencies. So the lung will respond to a frequency that is different from the liver. So as you can see, here we have extremely different frequencies in both environments. It's not true if I put a rat in the cockpit and a rat in my car that they would develop the same problems. It's not true because the frequencies are completely different and the tissues respond differently to different frequencies. So, this is the new method of how we are now measuring noise. This is a mink farm. Mink from the coats, the beautiful coats that uh, uh, w one can have uh, in Denmark. I don't know if you've heard about this. In this particular case, it is wind turbines. I have to say, before we go on with this wind turbines, two things. They're not wind mills. They're not. Windmills are the old ones that had a sail, right? Wind turbines is a machine. It's a generator. Please stop calling them windmills. I don't know what the word in, is Slovenian, but in Germany and in Denmark and in Holland, they call them windmolen. They're not windmolen. They're wind turbina. It's completely different. The second thing I have to say is, we have nothing against wind turbines. We have maybe as much against wind turbines as we have against airports, metros, public transportation, other industrial complexes. We study the effects of infrasound and low frequency noise wherever they come from. And wind turbines is the last in a very long list of complexes, industrial complexes that generate this type of acoustic pollution. I like the term acoustic pollution. It does not mean that you hear it. Noise implies you hear it. So, in this case, this is in Denmark. Um, of course, the home has been abandoned, obviously. Uh, they can no longer live there. And the man, they have a mink farm, so the man has to go back to the home each time to take care of the animals. We measured the noise in two locations. One location is an older type of a shed, and this is the new type of shed. Here, for the purposes of this presentation, I will just show you the results of the new type of the shed in, term, in the interest of time. There's other things to talk about. So, in location two, the new shed, this is the 
old way or the, the way legislation demands that we measure noise. Without wind turbines and with wind turbines rotating. Legislation looks at this only. This is DBA. This is the only thing that they will look at in terms of the noise. And here also, without wind turbines and with wind turbines, you can see in DBA, the difference is not so much. But you are exposed to a lot more acoustic energy with the wind turbines rotating than without. But this is not reflected by legislation, as you can see. Legislation looks at this red bar only and does not care about this gray bar, which reflects the acoustic energy that is actually present. This is the old way of doing things. We now have a new machine. Why is it important, this new machine? As you saw in the previous picture, it's like a photograph stopped in time. Here, we have time from zero to 600 seconds. It's 10 minutes. So what I am showing you here is 10 minutes of the acoustic environment without wind turbines and 10 minutes of the acoustic environment with wind turbines. Of course, the more yellow it gets, the higher the intensity, the higher the dBs. Notice what happens with the wind turbines. You have a clear pulse. It's clear. As it's yellow, it's not a continuous line. If it was continuous, you cannot get this information from data like this. There is no time factor. And we are finding out that the pulse, the time of the pulse is important for the biological response. It is not just the frequency. It is not just how the amplitude, the dBs. It is also very important, the pulse code. That is important for biology. So we have, of course, abandoned uh, the pr previous method. We really don't care what legislation says. We are not usually measuring for legislation. We are measuring to try to understand what is the effects on the biology. So, this is another view of the same data that we are now collecting. This is without the wind turbine, and this is with the wind turbine. Notice these little lines. In mathematics, there is something called harmonic series. It studies events that are periodical, okay? The wind turbine is absolutely periodical. It falls exactly on a harmonic series where the fundamental frequency has to do with the blade pass, uh, the number of times it passes per second. It is absolutely mathematical. This is not wind. Wind does not go mathematically on a harmonic series. There is no comparison, there is no idea that this level of noise or acoustic energy is caused by wind, absolutely not. Or the ocean, okay? Nothing in, in terms of the nature really, really falls on this very precise harmonic series. It's a mathematical tool that we use. And now notice one more thing all below 10 hertz. So DBA <laughs> is not going to be useful ever if we want to really quantify and analyze what is happening with the biology and in the presence of low frequency noise. So, <laughs> vibroacoustic disease. Again, yes, uh, this year it is 30 years that I am involved in this initiative. Um, we, I'm not, it is impossible to tell you all the results of 30 years of research in an hour. So I have selected the most important features to tell you. Of course, there will be a lot more to say after this hour, but I will select the most important features. 
How did this all start? In 1980, Dr. Castello Branco was, he became chief medical officer at the Air Force Base at Ogma in Portugal. As a medical doctor, he went to visit all the workplaces of his workers to see what was to be worried about, what he needed to, you know, protect his workers. I don't know, I suppose none of you have airplanes, but if you have an airplane, you must bring the airplane for maintenance. After the maintenance is done, there is a procedure called run-up procedure. This time, at this time, you put the aircraft stopped on the, the street, on the tarmac, and you test all the regimes of the engines. And while this is happening, you have quality control people around the aircraft making checklists. This is called a run-up procedure. Dr. Castello Branco was observing a run-up procedure. And he saw, at one point, one worker walking without purpose, and he was going directly to the exhaust of the turbines without purpose. And he saw a colleague grab this worker. When the run-up was finished, he went to the colleague and he asked him, what, what, what happened? You had to hold your, your worker. What happened there? And the colleague says, oh, yes, it happens sometimes. Nobody knows why, you know. In 1960s, there was a guy. We could not hold him in time, and he died. And the doctor is like, what? You cannot have workers with this threat, with this you know, difficulty. So he went back, and again, this is a Portuguese Air Force base that exists since 1918. So since 1950, all the medical records of the workers are kept on the medical center on the base. So he went through the medical records, and he found that 10% of the workers had already been diagnosed with late onset epilepsy. Late onset means you develop it in adult, not a child, not child epilepsy. And of course, uh, uh, the general population expected number was 0.2%. Definitely, there is a problem here. You don't want guys with uh, epileptic seizures working with heavy equipment like airplanes and engines. So a study was begun. 1980 to 1986, epilepsy is a neurological uh, problem. So all the neurological tests were given to these aircraft workers. Dr. Branco is a pathologist. He is the guy who does the autopsies and he analyzes under the microscope the tissues. In 1983, one technician died, of course. Dr. Branco wants to make the autopsy to understand why this person died. He died suddenly. The family says, no, 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 no. No autopsy, no, 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 no. So another colleague understood the importance of having an autopsy. And he went, in 1983, he went to the notary and he had a will made demanding an autopsy when he died. 1987, September, 7 o'clock in the morning, Dr. Branco receives a phone call from this man who had gone to the notary. The man said, Doctor, I am not feeling well. I am going to die. I have called the ambulance. Please meet me at the hospital so that we can do the autopsy. The doctor, of course, ah, you're, you're not going to die today. I will, of course, meet you at the hospital. Good, you call the ambulance. There will be no autopsy today. When Dr. Branco arrived at the hospital, the man was dead. And the autopsy was done. This is what we found. We found two tumors, silent tumors. There was no suspicion that this man had a tumor let alone two. One of the most incredible things is this man in his heart, each time you have an infarct, a heart attack, you, th there is a scar that is formed in the heart. This man had 11 scars and he died of the 12th. 
which was a scar so small in the regulated tables, it doesn't even count as an infarct because it was below two millimeters. One of the most extraordinary things we found was an abnormal thickening of cardiovascular structures, which I will go into a bit more. And also we found pulmonary fibrosis. We didn't care. Oh, pulmonary fibrosis. The man is exposed to chemicals. The man, you know, maybe even smokes. Pulmonary fibrosis was not something we paid much attention to at this stage. What we did find out was that there's no way that this is only in the central nervous system. If you have thickening of cardiovascular structures and 11 silent heart attacks, no way this is only related to the nervous system. So, one of the structures that was thickened is called the pericardium. This is a pericardium. It's very, very thin. It is normally less than 0.5 millimeters in thickness. What we found in our patients later, not only in the autopsy, is that sometimes in this pericardium goes to 2.3 millimeters, from 0.5 normal to 2.3. These are pictures of the pericardium of people who had cardiac surgery for other reasons. These people were recommended for cardiac surgery by the national healthcare system, unrelated to us. Both patients have cardiovascular problems. This one is not due to noise. This one is due to noise. Notice, please, that the scales are the same. I did not come here and make this bigger for you to see. They are absolutely the same. Curiously, I don't know how many medical people we have in the audience, but curiously, even though you know the heart is always opening and closing, this pericardium is around the heart, is now very thick. You would think, oh, the heart will have problems in opening. It does not. In our patients, it does not. The electrocardiogram in these patients is normal. There is no constriction of the heart despite the existence of this very thickened structure. I could talk about this for an hour as a biomedical engineer. I will not, so I will go on. Is it necessary to have cardiac surgery to see a thickened pericardium? No, no. We have ultrasound, echocardiography, you know, like for the babies, but for the heart. So we can look in the echo of the patient if there is a thickened pericardium. What is the problem here? There is a condition called pericarditis, which is an inflammation of the pericardium. And in the echo, it may appear this way. But when you have pericarditis, you have diastolic dysfunction and you have an inflammatory process. In our patients, you see this in the echocardiography, there is no diastolic dysfunction, there is no inflammatory process. Usually doctors call this idiopathic, and it's not a problem when the, it's under these conditions. So, this is an example of how we can monitor the effects of infrasound and low frequency noise exposure without cardiac surgery, of course. There are other ways, there's um, other tests, but um, this is one of them, echocardiography. The thickening of cardiovascular structures is not only in the pericardium, it also occurs in the blood vessels, the walls of the blood vessels. This is where the blood is going. You see this thickness, it's supposed to be thin like that, and it gets thick. This is in a rat. This is in a human. See this, this is blood, 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 blood. And here, the wall of the artery is thick. It is supposed to be thin. What happens when you have a thickened artery, the walls? It, if the walls are getting thick and thick and thick, the artery closes, right? Sometimes it closes, not because the walls are thick, but because you are eating McDonald's. 
and here is all the cholesterol, huh? and it closes. In our people, in our patients, there is cardiovascular problems, not because of closing of the artery, of because there is things there, but there is cardiovascular problems because the walls get thicker and thicker and it closes the blood. When you're talking about coronary arteries, these are very small. And so it's very easy. That's why we had 11 silent infarcts. 11. This means that 11 times the coronary arteries closed, occluded, and were no longer able to pass blood, and hence you have um, a problem. We do not, oops, we do not at all believe that this growth, uh, this has been extensively studied. It's being, the growth is made of collagen and elastin. This is not inflammatory process, it is not liquid, it is collagen and elastin, very organized structures of collagen and elastin that are uh, growing in the body abnormally. The technical word for it is morphogenesis. It's the growth of tissue which is not supposed to be there. We do not uh, at all believe that this is going through the ear, that this is being triggered by something auditory. It is being triggered by exposure to whole body to what? Inanimate mechanical forces. This is the body trying to strengthen itself. We will see more of this. In 1999, because we had been studying this for 19 years by that time, we uh, came uh, to, to study the clinical evolution of the disease. For the scientists who are present, this is based on an initial group of 306 technicians. They were eliminated if they had cardiovascular disease, diabetes, streptococcal infections, neuroleptics, huge list of selection criteria. Of the 306, 140 stayed for the study. 140 men, aeronautical technicians, clean. No prior diseases. If the symptom is on the list, it means that at least 50% of these 140 has de developed this. At least 70 people of the 140 had bronchitis after four years of exposure, occupational exposure. At least 70 had blood in the urine after or up to 10 years of exposure and so on. If it's on the list, 50% had it. We didn't ask them, we went through their medical records. It's something that is in the history of the person. We didn't go, oh, do you have blood in urine? No, he went to the doctor before because he had blood in urine. So this has uh, importance for the scientific validity of this sort of uh, clinical stages. Another feature which is terrible is this is cumulative. Just because you are now with the hemorrhages of the nose and you have a severe muscle pain doesn't mean your bronchitis has gone away. Doesn't mean that you have stopped having blood in urine. This is cumulative. And if you, there are medical doctors here, huh? so you have a guy who comes to you, oh, you know, doctor, I have problems with the breathing, and I have problems in the skin, and I have problems in the stomach, and my knees hurt, and my back hurts, and the doctor's like, okay, wait a minute. You know, usually you don't have a person complaining of every organ and system that they have. But if you are, the doctor suspects the noise, then it can be found out. If it's a female that comes with these problems, well, you know what happens, right? Oh, you should get something to do. You are being hysterical. Well, what do you do? Your, your children are out of the house and now you are inventing diseases. This was used in court in Dublin 
for a woman who was 52 years old, developing vibroacoustic disease, had all these symptoms, and this is what was said in court. Oh, your children are all out of the house, now you have nothing to do, and you go on the internet and you invent diseases. This was used. So, respiratory pathology. This has been occurring in the aeronautical technicians. Remember, we are only still in the occupational environment. We are not yet talking about residential. This is only occupational. We found that whether you're smoking or not smoking, there is these problems with the workers. This is what really motivated us to begin the studies with the rats in the laboratory. This was the type of noise profile that the rats were exposed to, and we exposed the rats to occupational schedule. Eight hours a day, five days a week, weekends in silence. Because this is what the workers were exposed to, and we wanted to find out how it was they had all these respiratory problems, smokers or non-smokers. We found thickening again, this time in the alveolar, the walls of the lung inside where the exchange of oxygen and CO2 occurs. It was thickened. Notice again, the scale is the same. And the rats aren't smoking. So it has nothing to do with smoking. They are only exposed to noise. This is the trachea. The trachea, so it's here, we take it out, we cut it open, we open it, and we photograph. So what you are seeing is this area is where the air passes through. We all know we have the cilia and uh, the brush cell. So this is a normal rat trachea before it was exposed to noise, and this is after it is exposed to noise. You can see the cilia are basically gone. These are the brush cells. You even see the natural and interesting organization of cells in the trachea. This is again the trachea. This is called the brush cell. These little things that are sticking out, they are made of a biopolymer called actin. This is one of the many uh, materials that makes up our body collagen, actin, tubulin. These are made of actin. Look what happens when you begin to expose it to noise. They begin to gather together and fuse, and they fuse more. And this is a dead brush cell in the trachea of rats exposed to noise. We, of course, have to study the ear of the rat, of course. This is the normal ear. So, this membrane here is called the basal membrane. And on the basal membrane, you have the cilia. On top, there is something called tectorial membrane. For this picture, we cut out the tectorial membrane to see the basal and the cilia. When there is a sound, the basal moves, and the cilia are therefore vibrating, and then it touches the tectorial to the auditory nerve. This is how it normally works. These are also made of actin. And notice here you have spaces. They are missing cilia. This is due to the normal aging process. We all, with age, lose our hearing, and the rats do too. So this is normal. What happens in noise? This is the tectorial membrane, which is now fused to the cilia. And the cilia are fused amongst themselves. We had to almost cut off the tectorial membrane to get this picture. It was not easy, like in the controls, you just lift. Here we had to pull it off to see that they are all fused together. So now, under this situation, they are all fused together and with the upper part. But the basal doesn't stop moving. 
When there is a sound, the basal will continue to move, but now they are not freely vibrating, they are pulling. We have postulated that this is the reason for noise annoyance. It is not something just psychological, psychosomatic. There is an organic basis for people who feel very annoyed to noise. We did not do, during the autopsy in 1987, we did not look at the cochlea. We do not know if this is happening in the humans. It is interesting, though, that both in the trachea, actin brush cell, and in the ear, don't forget, this is actin. It is also fusing here in the trachea of the rats and in the cochlea of um, the animals. So, there is hearing effects when you are exposed to infrasound and low frequency noise. The hearing effects are of a completely different profile than if the hearing is hurting your noise, uh, your ears, and making you deaf. When you are deaf, you cannot hear because there's so much noise from hearing exposure, you go into the house, you want to listen to television, and what you do, you put the volume up, right? Because you want to hear it. Not these people. These people put it down, they can't stand it. It's a completely different profile of the human who is exposed to noise going deaf and exposed to noise infrasound and low frequency noise. In the rats, when it's a Wistar rat, the white rats, they are usually used uh, for uh, research. In the rats, when you make the sound of a kiss like that, they don't like it. They look, they get tense, and they don't like it. Normal rats. When you do this to noise exposed rats, this sound, they start shaking, they get up on the two legs, and they fall backwards. Different profile from infrasound uh, exposure or sound exposure. And of course, this is, uh, in terms of interpretation, it is very similar to an epileptic-like seizure that the rats are having after exposure. So it's very different. Um, one of the most, if there are medical people here seeing patients, one of the most common complaints in infrasound and low frequency noise people is, I wake up tired, I can't stand any noise, not even music. You understand the social implications of this. People who cannot stand noise, they isolate themselves. Restaurants, they don't go to restaurants. They don't go to the movies. They hate driving in the car. Sometimes just the supermarket, the part where the freezers or the refrigerators are, it's unbearable for them. This is completely different than the guy who has lost the hearing. He goes to the restaurant. It's a pain. He's always, ah, ah, but he's there. People with infrasound and low frequency noise, they isolate themselves. They cannot stand it. They become incompatible with the environment. So I have two, cell, two slides of cell biology, which I feel I must give you. Is this your idea of a cell? a little round balloon with things floating inside. This is what they teach us in school, isn't it? This little round balloon. Well, cells are really more like this. They are connected, or the architecture of the cell is based on tensegrity. It is an architectural concept based on continuous tension and discontinuous compression. What does this mean? It means that the cell, when it is confronted with what? Inanimate mechanical force, which is a pressure wave, it can move and it passes on the perturbation or the information to other cells. It's not a bubble. It's not an elastic balloon. What you are seeing are movies from the Ingber Laboratory at Harvard University. Here, he has shown for 30 years, and there are already therapeutic measures based on this model of the cell. 
this is how the cell reacts to a force along the vertical axis and how it relax, reacts to laminar flow, which is what happens when you are exposed to a pressure wave that comes and affects your whole body. So, what happens in the residences? In the beginning, we were very skeptical about people complaining about infrasound and low frequency noise in the residence. Very skeptical. We were used to working in the aeronautic industry. That's noise. In the homes. You walk in, you really don't hear it necessarily. But in the year 2000, we started getting calls from private individuals. Please come to our house. We have a noise in our house. We are sick. You must come. We went, and the people in the houses, they were complaining exactly the same things as the aircraft technicians. But we didn't believe it. It's not possible. Look, we measured the noise. This is an example. This is in Lisbon. This is the Tagus River. Here is the veranda, the terrace of the house, and this monster is just across the water. This is, uh, has to do with the grain and the ships. The ships come, there are some arms, and it goes into the cargo of the ship, and it sucks up the grain into the silos. And then another ship comes, and they put the grain back into another ship. So we measured the noise, and this is the cockpit. This time the cockpit is in white, but in black was what we got in this particular house. And we thought, this is not possible, it's so low. But we gave the people who were complaining with the same symptoms as our workers, we gave them the tests, the medical diagnostic tests which we know were applicable, and they came up positive. So we know we have a problem. And we started thinking, how is this possible? Of course, if you are living, if it is in your home, it means you are sleeping in it. The woman in this particular case already had the pregnancy of the baby in the house before the EU directive, which demands that these industries stop at 11 o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night, like airports, right? They must stop at night. This woman was pregnant in this house with the baby before that. So it was nonstop, all the time. Her husband is an architect, he was working in the house, and he was the first who started feeling something strange. He was the one who contacted us. So what we have found, the clinical stages of vibroacoustic disease, as they were defined for occupation, is actually accelerated in the home accelerated in time because people are sleeping in it, people are staying there a long time in the house, so the exposure is much more. The working guy, right, he goes home at the end of the day. He doesn't go there on the weekends, well, usually not on the weekends, right? Not at the home. There is no running away if it's in your home. And now the wind turbines. You see, it's not about wind turbines. It's about infrasound and low frequency noise. This is the wind turbine case, the first that we documented in 2007. This was the home. These are the four wind turbines. This one was 800 meters. This one was very close, 200. Uh, and this was between 200 and 800. So they started rotating in November 2006. In March of 2007, the parents received a letter from the teacher of the boy. What is wrong with this child? This child is an excellent student, and now he is going down, down, down. He has no energy. He, he cannot even do physical education in the school. Is this child getting enough sleep? Of course, by you know six months after they started rotating, also the parents were feeling already very sick, and that's how we got involved. So, of course, we went to measure the infrasound and low-frequency noise. Still, the old methods, it only goes down to 6.3. This is the old photograph method. The red is when they are not rotating, 
and the black and the gray is when they are rotating in the night and in the day, in the bedroom. That's another thing that sometimes it's very funny for me or sad, I'm not quite sure. But they measure the noise outside of the house. Outside of the house. I'm not sleeping out there. I'm not living, eating, enjoying my life. It's not outside, I'm in the house. Anybody who is here who has experienced the resonance inside the home. Sometimes you are in a store and there is a, a bus outside with the engine going and you feel it inside the, 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 the structure. You walk outside the structure, you don't feel it anymore, of course, because it's going away. So inside, if you want to really understand health effects of this, you have to go inside the home where they are, like the workers. You don't go to the kitchen to find out how the worker is being exposed. You go to where the worker is working. And so measuring noise outside the home is not very useful when we are trying to determine health effects. So what happened to this case? The man took it all to court. And uh, of course, these are the wind turbines. He took it to court in 2007. In 2013, the Portuguese Supreme Court said, out, all of them must go down. And they took him down, this one, that one, that one, and that one. But meantime, they put more. So the man won the battle and lost the war. Now he has no money to fight uh, for the other ones. So he still, like the guy from the mink farm in Denmark, he still has to go to this house because he has horses. These are Lusitanian pedigree horses. The man is a bullfighter. So he used to have the horses for the bullfighting. What happens to his horses in the bullfighting or the, the, that he had uh, on his property, they developed what is called boxy foot. I don't know if we have horse people here, but this is a problem in some horses. All of them developed boxy foot until the wind turbines, none. He had not one case of boxy foot. Even the small horses who are brought to the farm, they develop boxy foot. So it's not in utero only the problem of this boxy foot. There is a solution, there is a surgical solution for the boxy foot. So of course, when the surgery was going, Dr. Branco wants biopsy, wants to look at the tissues to see what he could find, and he found the same, thickened of uh, the arteries, the walls of the arteries in these horses are thickened, as we saw in the rats, as we saw in the people. So, I have decided, I don't usually include all these pictures, I have decided the time has come to include them all. I usually only put this one and that one, because it's shocking. This is the deformations of the rats whose mothers were in the noise in the laboratory, in our laboratory. This is another horse, the same uh, farm of uh, Boxy. This is the mink farm. This is a freezer full of dead fetuses from the mink. The lawyer has told this man to keep them. This is proof. You don't have this amount of death in mink. He didn't have, he has a mink farm for 30 years. He never saw anything like this. And this particular one is this year's aborted fetus from the mink. This is not wind turbines. It's coal mining activities in Australia. This is not a farm, it's a private person who has chickens and turkeys and ducks. And this is what happened, it's, I'm showing one, there is more, the feet of the little chickies whose mother was in the noise. And these are non-viable eggs that are born on this farm because of infrasound and low frequency noise contamination. I don't like to show them, but at this point I think I must, 
particularly because we are among mostly scientists and professional people, I uh, refrain from showing these, these pictures and that one to the general public because I, it's not the point to scare people, it's the point to inform. So, now we have just pictures. This is the Blue Mountains in, near Sydney, near in Australia. Beautiful view, right? One would think, no wind turbines. Beautiful. And look, <gasps> what is this? This speaks to the desperation of the people who are living in homes exposed to infrasound and low frequency noise. This is what this man is trying to do, to build a wall, to protect, I, you remember? It has to be, it has, this is not enough. It has to be <laughs> 343 meters if we want to protect against one hertz. So I'm showing these pictures because people are desperate. If you're building a wall to cover that beautiful view I just showed you, how desperate are you? This man, the bedroom is up here, but now his bed is in the kitchen here in this area. This is where the man and his wife are sleeping. But that's Australia, and that is not wind turbines. Here we have wind turbines. This is Germany. This is the home. This is a lake. And I'm only showing you up to 2,000 meters, two kilometers. If I extend to five kilometers, there's more, more, more. So when they moved into this home, there were only two wind turbines here, smaller ones, the 70 meters high. These now are the 2.3 megawatts, which are higher than uh, 70 meters. This is their bedroom. From here, you could see the lake. It was a beautiful bedroom, which they abandoned. And they built a bunker bedroom, which is where they now sleep. This is the desperation of people. If you think people are inventing this, think again. Because if they're inventing this, they won't go to this trouble. Not at all. This, uh, I could go into the health effects, but this is a terrible situation. Finally, this is Ireland. This house has been abandoned for obvious reasons. The nine-year-old child who was living in this room, guess what? Diagnosed with epilepsy. The 19-year-old boy of this house, guess what? Diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. You know who else was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder? The man from the mink farm in Denmark. So, I hope you liked my presentation. I know it's kind of depressing, but these are the scientific facts of what we have over 30 years of research. <laughs>